Go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. Does anybody else sense the presence of the Lord here? Once again, good morning. I can tell you for a certainty, I believe that the Lord is not only here, that he has made himself known this morning. And so the last thing that I need to do is attempt to add to his presence with a bunch of unnecessary words. I believe that this just may be the shortest message I ever preach. Yeah, like we have heard that before, Pastor. Well, let's just see. Go to Luke chapter 2. And I'm starting at the 8th verse. Luke chapter 2, and I'm starting at the 8th verse. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace. Tell somebody peace. peace. Nothing better than peace. Boy, when you get it, you want to keep it. Don't let anybody take it from you. The peace. Stop worrying. You can't sleep having ulcers because you don't have peace. I bind the devil that has tried to take your peace. I bind the people that have tried to take your peace. No devil in hell can take your peace, and don't let people take your peace. Your boss can't take your peace. Your supervisor can't take your peace. An unhappy family member cannot take your peace. It's your peace. You got to give it to them because God gave it to you. And the devil can't take anything from you that God gave unless you give it to him or give him permission to come get it. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread, because Jesus was the bread of life. And see this thing that has come to pass, come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. There he was in a manger. Somebody say in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. This is about the shepherds. This is the shepherds' narrative of the birth of Yeshua HaMashiach, the prophesied Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And I want to preach or teach for a few moments from the subject heading, The Greatest Gift. The Greatest <laughs> Gift. First of all, Merry Christmas to everybody. The greatest gift. I am grateful. Uh, our worship and arts department has just done an unbelievably exemplary job. Come on, y'all. Let them know you appreciate them. Unbelievable. Unbelievable in our worship, in our music, in our dance, in our lighting. In our sound, our camera operators, can we thank all of the people who serve? How many people are ready for Christmas? You ready for it? Some of you still have a couple things to go get. I don't buy anything for anybody till December 24th and a half. My wife will tell you, she'll be like, babe, you done shopping? I'm like, done? I still got four whole hours at the mall before it closed. <laughs> I'll get there about 3.57, and 
and I'll be there for a hot two hours, and I'll get everything I need. Now, my wife, she likes to go to the mall, and she likes to, sh you know, just like browse. I'm not a browser. I don't, I don't, I don't browse. I'm a grown man. Uh, when I go to the mall, I know what I'm going for. I go get it, and I leave. I'm out. I don't like traffic. I don't want to sit down. I don't want to talk. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hang out. My wife said, oh my gosh, look at that store, it's so cute. Look at that, oh, it's baby clothes. Like, but we, our kids are grown. They, my kids are 43 years old now. And, and we're, we're all over the mall. She likes to, to walk around. It's, it's, it's one of her love languages, the time spent. We go around, share it. But for me, when she goes into a store, I'm finding the couch. I'm looking for a chair, and there's only two chairs, and it's me and four other men, and we all see the chair. And I give them the look like, don't try it. I'm crazy. I will set it off. I get to that chair, and she's like, babe, what do you think? I'm like, you got to come here. I'm not getting up, because if I get up, they're going to take my chair. So you got, you're going to spin around, twirl around right here. I throw money at you, whatever you want, then we can make this a party. But then my wife is a giver, so she loves to give gifts more than even receive. It, just, it blesses her. And... One of her things is not just the gift, but the presentation. It's all about the presentation. Tell somebody it's all about the presentation. Now, my family will tell you, they know when I gift wrap. My mama said, it's what? It's terrible. My wife laughs at me. She's like, babe, what are you doing? You can see a piece of the pack. She's like, they're going to tear the paper up anyway. This paper don't make sense. Just like lingerie. What you got it on for? It's going to be on for about 13 seconds. But I like the presentation, but the, the, the wrapping is coming off. I was just talking to the married folk. Y'all y'all, y'all just going to leave me hanging. All right, you're like, this is a Christmas program. We have children here. How you think they got here? <laughs> Why you love me so? You wasn't listening to that when them kids. <laughs> oh, Holy Ghost. There's something about the wrapping that signifies the level of value and time that you put into the thought that you're giving this gift to a person. When, when, you, when you have the gold gift wrap paper, with the shiny situation, with the bow. Now, I've done a couple of those for my wife, but I went to the, to the department store people. And I let them do it. They take a knife and they, you know, they do the ribbon and it curls up. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. I didn't know how y'all did that. You love that? Note to self. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get a gift like that on Wednesday. Um, the wrapping matters. Our gift was wrapped in swaddling cloths. Tell somebody the wrapping matters. I'm going to be so quick, you won't even believe it. There were shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. We've all heard this story. How many people have heard this narrative of Jesus' birth? There were shepherds in the field. I've even preached that the shepherds, according to Jewish tradition, are the, the lowest uh, on the totem pole in the area of, of authority or influence or credibility. But I did some studying, and it is a significant study for me because there's a man named Alfred Edersheim who lived from like 1829 to 1895. He was Jewish. He was born Jewish. Uh, and as he studied the life of Jesus, he became a Messianic Jew and wrote uh, an unbelievable book. And the book is entitled uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And in this book, he gives us the history and the cultural context for the birth of Jesus. And it blew my mind that as I studied and I asked the Lord to give me more wisdom and insight so that I could share with you because we're all excited about the gifts we're going to get under the tree. But there's only one gift that matters. And his name is Jesus Christ. In all of human history, there is no greater gift that has ever been given than the Son of the living God. And how God wrapped him mattered. 
How you wrap a gift matters. When you put all that extra heavy glittery gold and all of that, you're prioritizing the external because you're saying that the value of the thing under it is going to be even greater than the package you see. When it came to Jesus, not only how he was wrapped, but where the gift was laid. Why would you put something valuable in such a vulnerable, compromising, unsanitary place? Because Jesus was to fill the very worst parts of our humanity and then work his way up. I wish I had six and a half people to help me. In studying, why did God talk to shepherds when Bethlehem is five and a half, I mean, Jerusalem is five and a half kilometers away? It's not far. Why wouldn't you go to Herod? Why wouldn't you go to Augustus? Why wouldn't you go to Quirinius? Why wouldn't you go to one of the big leaders and say, hey, my son is here, bow down when he comes to your town? Because he came as the savior of the Jews. This is very important. Now, we get grafted in through faith, so don't worry. But when he was born, he was born as a fulfillment of prophecy to the children of Israel. So it's interesting to find out that these shepherds who were in the field were not just regular shepherds. I'm getting ready to help you because God doesn't announce something like that to just any old body. He wouldn't announce it to somebody who wouldn't understand the significance of what he was saying. He didn't just say this to people who were not schooled, learned, trained, or expecting for God to do something. God shows up where there's a hunger. God shows up where there's a thirst. God shows up where there's a passion. God does not show up where he's not invited. He's God. He doesn't have to crash a party. He is the party. In the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition of Judaism, the, the oral tradition shows us that you are not allowed to feed or care for sheep inside the city limits. You could not feed in open fields. You had to do that out on the outskirts of the city. But these sheep were inside the city, which means they weren't ordinary sheep and these weren't ordinary shepherds getting ready to help you. There are some sheep that, that are outskirts. You don't have to worry about them. Stop worrying about the sheep on the outskirts. Stop worrying about people on the peripheral. Stop worrying about people on the outside. God has something better. Just tell somebody, stay, stay inside, stay inside. Stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. These were not regular sheep. According to the oral tradition of Jewish history, there, there was a, a, a necessary amount of sheep that were fed and raised inside the city limits, but they were for a specific purpose, and it was to be sacrifices. Well, I'm trying to help you so that your, your Christmas understanding of the story will match your passion for Jesus. The sheep inside the city that were raised by these shepherds were raised to die. They were sacrificial lambs. So these weren't regular priests. They were Levitical shepherds. Pastor, what are you talking about? It's too early. I just want to get home and I got a, a Christmas turkey. Let me help you. The Levitical shepherds were of the Levitical order. Only the Levites could touch the ark. The ark was the presence of God. So God sent an angel to announce to the Levites there's something better than the ark right down the street. The presence, the manifest presence, the thing that the ark whispered about is actually down the street. And since you're a Levite, you've been waiting on this, the consolation of Israel. And since you all have been sacrificing lamb after lamb, I want you to know that you are not going to have to sacrifice lambs anymore because there's a baby down the street that is the ultimate payment for sin. So your job will be fulfilled when you go take a look at this. The Levitical shepherds understood that the angel was saying the propitiation or full payment for sin 
is found in this baby. And then the angel said to them, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths. You know why that would be significant to a Levitical shepherd? Because only spotless lambs were allowed to be the sacrifice. And they had to put the lambs in swaddling cloths to keep them from being injured or bruised. Otherwise, they would not be able to be sacrificed for the sins of the people. So the angel let them know what you've been doing with animals, God has done once and for all through a baby. I'm talking about the greatest gift. I wish I had someone who can hear my heart. What you're wrapped in matters. So the shepherds went and looked, and they said, it is as the angel has said. There's a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. Why would you wrap a baby in the same cloth that you'd wrap a lamb in? Now behold, the lamb, the precious lamb of God, born into sin that I may live again. The precious lamb of God. I know you got a tree up. I know you got lights up. I know you got garland up. I know you're going to go across the street to the mall and you're going to spend money and you're going to swipe your credit card and you're going to max out for people who aren't thinking about you. But can I encourage you to refocus your gratitude and thanksgiving on the ultimate gift and how he was wrapped. If people don't want to be grateful for what you give, if people don't want to, want to understand what this season is about, it's not about them, it's not about me, it's not about us, it's about Jesus, and it's about what the Father did for us. He gave us the greatest gift that could ever be given. Some of y'all are going to be wrapping gifts till late at night so your kids can get up and, and have toys and games that they will not be thinking about six days later. <laughs> it's the truth. I remember getting my kids toys a few years ago, and they were so excited when they opened it and then went and played with the box. Because some people value other things over others. And, and here's just a note. Stop unwrapping yourself to people who don't know your value. Good night. Because they won't even engage your substance. They'll just play with the wrapping. They'll just deal with your flesh. They'll, they'll deal with the external. And you're saying, but I'm giving you my heart. They don't want your heart. They want to play games. So be careful who you unwrap yourself to. Whether it's single, whether it's professional, whether it's in any area of life, be careful who you let close. Because everybody who smiles is not there for your good. Two things I want to give you, and this sermon is over. The greatest gift... You see how this is wrapped? I love wrapping paper. It ascribes value. But there are two things I want you to wrap yourself with for this Christmas. And I know that there are some conservative theologians and, and Bible scholars who will be like, haven't you read Jeremiah 10, what it talks about with the trees and the lights? I have. I know exactly what you're talking about. What about the pagan side of this tradition and this holiday? I know. I know all about it. I don't care when Jesus was born. I just care that he was born. I can celebrate Christmas, June 23rd. Most theologians believe he was born in the spring or summer anyway, but it doesn't matter what day we celebrate as long as we focus on Jesus Christ, who is the full payment for sin. Stop letting people shame you from celebrating. You want to buy something for your family? Do that. Just don't go into debt killing yourself. That's not wisdom, and that's not the heart of the season. But there are a couple things that you should wrap. And if you're going to wrap, wrap yourself in this. Number one, wrap yourself in gratitude. I got two amens. I told you it's going to be the shortest sermon ever. Wrap yourself in gratitude. Be thankful for what you do have. Be thankful that you have your life. Be thankful that you have some measure of health and strength. 
Be thankful that it's not as bad as it could be. Be thankful for what the Lord has done in your life. Be thankful for how much favor he's shown you. Have some gratitude. Wrap yourself in gratitude. It'll change your perspective on the entire holiday season. Because many people struggle through depression during the holidays because of a a broken relationship or the loss of a loved one. And I understand that. And my prayer is that beyond our prayers and our hope that you will get the necessary counseling certified therapist that can help you navigate and walk through these things. Because sometimes prayer is a great component, but there's more that God wants to do. And he will use therapists and mental health professionals to help you walk through that. If you're struggling with depression, call the church. We can push you towards resources. Do not struggle alone. But wrap yourself in gratitude. Maybe you don't have everything you want, but you got more than what you need. This Christmas, I'm grateful for my family. The more I think about the miracles of my wife and my kids and my mother, my mother in love and my father in love, the more I have gratitude. Why do I have gratitude? Because any of them could have been gone at any moment. You need to thank God for what you have. Stop arguing with your spouse. Thank God, because if anything happened right now, it would break your heart. Get it right. You got a family member, y'all can't stand each other, get it right. Have gratitude. God, thank you. I know we haven't always done or had everything the way it needs to be, but let's get it right. Have a heart of gratitude. Thank God for your family. This is the stuff that matters. Get it right with your loved ones. Get it right with your soul. It is well with my soul. Be grateful because every day is a gift. I remember when I thought I was going to lose my mama. Show my video. Love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Meaning, beyond what looks like adversity, I'm going to do something great from this. Yes. You think, do, you think I, do you think for a moment God is going to do something great? If, my, if, my, if I'm grabbing off the mouth on the day it's supposed to be bad news, I'm telling you. Hallelujah. It's going to happen when I have the good news. And then to, to a scan, they'll say, this is great. You know, we didn't see anything. Hallelujah. Oh, that's really great. Wow. But I, somebody better be around me because I'm going to be happy. <laughs> you better take me out of there and get me on the street or something. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, you, you don't know how happy I was at getting so-called bad news. Because, Jesus. Oh, God. That means that I said, Lord, they can't do anything. They can't do anything for me. Isn't that wonderful? You have to do it. Amen. And you will do it. That was June 23rd of 2011. We had just left the cancer clinic where they said, you have months to live. And she's encouraging the family, talking about, if you see me worshiping now, wait till they tell me there's no cancer in my body. <laughs> Having gratitude has nothing to do with the news you got, your bank account, what people say. Gratitude is a posture that you have when you have a relationship with a God that's greater than the thing you're facing. My mother had the nerve to encourage the family not to pray, but to agree with her that it was already done. She was thanking God with cancer in her body four days later. It was gone. And now here she is, eight years later, standing here, worshiping God in relentless church. I don't take one day for granted. Stand up. I'm almost done. Just stand up. Tell somebody, don't take one day for granted. <laughs> Love while you got a chance. Forgive while you have a chance. Get it right while you have a chance. Wrap yourself in gratitude. When you leave here in a few minutes, thank the Lord for the life and the breath in your lungs. Stop complaining. 
there are many of us who have things we wish we had and things we wish could change. But if we have a heart of gratitude, it will give us a fresh perspective. And the last point is wrap yourself in generosity. Wrap yourself in generosity. Live generously. Serve generously. Sow generously. Honor generously. Live a life of generosity. I shared that I, I gave whatever I had minus what I felt we needed for our house, a couple hundred dollars, and we were going to make it stretch because that's more than what my mama had many times. So we made it stretch. And I was content in my soul because I knew that God was going to do something miraculous. Then I see the Lord being generous to the vision that he gave my wife and I. And in less than a week, God starts unlocking uncommon generosity. You know what that means? We're going to be a more generous church. We're going to be sowing in the folk and blessing the people who are a part of this house. Even today, as we gave away hundreds of toys at 11 o'clock, we're going to do more. If you know people who need toys, tell them to get here. And we're going to give whatever we have, and we're going to make sure people have not only what they need, but more than what they need if, if the Lord is, is, is kind. Wrap yourself in gratitude. Wrap yourself in generosity. And then there's only one thing I want you to unwrap. I want you to unwrap grace. I want you to unwrap grace. And I want you to share that gift. <laughs> share grace with people. Extend grace to people. You don't know what people are going through. So unwrap grace. Don't judge them. Extend grace. Don't talk about them. Extend grace. Don't send direct messages. Extend grace. Don't gossip. Send grace. Extend grace. We wrap ourselves in gratitude, in generosity. But I will unwrap grace. And make sure you unwrap grace for the people you don't think deserve it. Because one day it might be you. And if you extend grace to others, when it's your turn, people will remember how you treated them. Lord, bless this church and this word, and I thank you for the hearts of the people. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus, or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, or if you want to be a member of Relentless Church, will you do me a favor and meet me at the front of this altar? There's a present down here with your name on it. His name is Jesus. Boy, you are handsome. Welcome home. She's not the only one. There are others. There are others. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms Here she comes. There she is. There's another one. Praise God. Nobody walks alone. All my elders, nobody walks alone. Welcome home. Is there anybody? Anybody? There's a couple of grown men that need to walk down here right now. Is there anybody? I'm going to wait on you to walk. 